The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. While some people were speaking about how the temple was adorned with costly stones and votive offerings, Jesus said, All that you see here, the days will come when there will not and there will not be left a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. Then they asked him, Teacher, when will this happen? And what sign will there be when all these things are about to happen? He answered, See that you do not be deceived, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, this, the time has come. Do not follow them. When you hear of war and insurrections, do not be terrified, for such things must happen first. But it will not immediately be the end. And he said to them, Nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famines, and plagues from place to place, and awesome sights might and mighty signs will come from the sky. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise now, what do you think God's thinking this morning? Sitting up there on a Tuesday. Oh my God, just another Tuesday. Often when I ask God, what, what do you think? He says, I don't think. I just love. Any volunteers want to give a reflection on these readings today? Emma, I think you'd be the best. There is in scripture, it says, and a child will lead them. I know you're not a child. You're all but a young adult by now. And I probably should stop picking on you because you're going to stop coming to church because you're by play embarrassed. But I think you're brave. And I think you're courageous. And I don't know how you know you very well. But if you had half a thought, I'd be curious to know. Now, you don't have to say anything. Don't worry. But if a 12 or 30 year, 12 and a half, 12 and a half, 38 days, 26 hours, and never mind. I bet you we'd get a decent reflection from a child about these things. And I bet a child wouldn't be worried. It's hard to know about what to say about such things. Other than, there's a lot that can be said, but as um, there was a poster on... um, I don't remember the priest's name at the moment. Uh, a poster on his door when I was in the seminary, a seminarian. And it said, after all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. You know what I mean? Context is always helpful. The first reading, and to some degree the second, it's from the book of Revelation. So it's a particular genre, it's a particular style of writing. And you have to remember that it was a very, not only tumultuous, but a very violent time. And so it's veiled language. And I I don't remember exactly what the word apocalyptic means, but it's not the terrible things that we think it is. If I recall vaguely correctly, it means something about God's proclamation, God's revelation. Now, why is it veiled language? Because uh, the Christians are being persecuted. And they came up with this veiled language or hidden language that they used that God or their proclamation, their sharing of faith in God was not recognized by their persecutors. But this reading seems to suggest that God himself was a little upset. You know, not only uh, one angel, uh, it almost implies that it's Jesus himself, 
Look at a cloud, and on the cloud was sitting one like looked like the Son of Man. Well, that's Jesus. And he's got a, a crown on his head and a sickle in his hand. But then another cam angel comes and used the sickle and reaped the harvest. I'm not well read enough on the book of Revelation to understand all the signs and symbols, but I suspect it has to do as the reading goes on, with those who are chosen, which is everybody, and those who allow themselves to be chosen and those who ignore it. But then there's another angel and then a third. Uh, but then one has a sharp sickle. Well, the other one was dull. And then the grapes. And they go, oh, oh, good, grapes, that must be the saved ones. But then God throws them into the press of the divine fury. Hmm. It seems in contradiction to the beautiful parable and image of the vine and the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine grower, and separated from me, you can do nothing. It's a beautiful, beautiful, intimate, really, image of God. And then the gospel, and this is very prevalent today, because there are those who may not be using these exact words, but, you know, in a religious frame and in political frames and just social frames, well, no, it's over here. No, you got to pray like that. No, you really have to do this. And if you do this, you'll be happier. And if you do that, you'll really be great. If you do this, you'll make a lot of money. Do this and do that. Well, what do we say? The main thing's the main thing, and the main thing has to say the main thing. And the main thing is... You could be a little more lively with that. I wrote a piece the other day. Stinnison, what's his name? Well, yeah, I think he's deceased now. He's from Belgium. Belgium. And I'll try to remember, but his point was having to do with some of this. And just to cut to the punchline, The elect, the believers, and those who are trying in whatever great or small way to, to actually put into action the faith that they hold in God against the, those who don't. And they will all be cast into the fire. Now, what would be the greatest torment of the evil ones after they die? Would it be more tormenting to them to be turn, um, cast into the fires of hell or into the fire of heaven? And the insight was, <laughs> the reality is, there's only one fire. Ooh. Because, you see, we have the fire of love, which is God, most identifiably, I suppose, the fire of the Spirit, so the elect, for those who long for and seek for God, I'll go back to the uh, verse yesterday from, from the, um, this is the people, the psalm. This is the people that longs to see God's face. Do you long to see God's face in any other image? You long for God. You long for wholeness. You long for justice and peace, politically, socially, relationally, in families, etc. The whole world, we want peace. So the elect, the chosen, who try to live to the best of their ability, the light of the gospel, will go to heaven and enjoy the fires of love. And it won't hurt. But will all the wicked be also brought to heaven and be tormented in that same fire of love because they can't stand it? You kind of have to think about that, don't you? Because God wants everybody to go to heaven. The word's not used here in either of the readings, but we can often hear, the, we, we hear the phrase or we say, God's wrath. Well, God's wrath is not God's punishment and God's swinging his sickle and, and whopping off the heads of his enemies. God's wrath is God's passion that we wake up and see and smell the coffee and give ourselves to the Lord. 
but too often we can't get beyond staring at ourselves and those things around us and all the things that most anxiously disturb us. And we forget that the world's passing and all this now that's so important and so critical, and it's not unimportant, but it is all passing. It does strike me that Jesus is quite literally referring in less than 50 years, the temple will be destroyed and there will not be one stone upon another. He's referring and prophesying of what will come 35 or so years after he died and rose from the dead. And these people at that time went through all that. And in light of all that trauma and all that violence and loss and destruction, 2,000 years later, here we are. We survived. Somehow through all that tumultuous loss and violence and war and destruction, they continued to believe. So there had to be more going on than what is right before our eyes. And what we can see, well, it's ruined now. Well, 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 well what are we going to do? Keep our eyes on Jesus. We pray. We believe. And we act on what we pray and what we believe. And we put some kind of face on that. So today it's suggested, so we're using the vote of mass for justice and peace in the world. Not just the United States, but all the world. And just to end on a positive note, because it's all positive ultimately, you know you're already going to heaven. You just have to survive the world, do some good along the way. You know, we don't see it here as a first world country, but in more countries than not around the world, particularly in first world countries, the church is thriving. And even the Catholic Church is thriving. Africa, I wish I had uh, more statistics. Or I wish I had more uh, examples that I could, I could share with you. But in more countries than not around the world, the church is thriving. More people are coming to the Catholic Church. They're coming to the sacraments because of the Eucharist. And that should be very encouraging to us. Maybe God has us exactly where God needs us to be. Maybe we've got a little too high on the hog, a little too fat around the midsection, and we're too comfortable with all that we have and all that we, all that is. Is God punishing? No. Maybe God's trying to wake us up and open our eyes. But don't be discouraged, because this time will pass, and another time will come. And that'll pass, and then a time will come after that. Do not go running around to those who say, I'm here, I'm there, he's over here. Where is Jesus? If you got an extra 10 seconds today, look in the mirror. And don't stop looking till you see Jesus. And put a big smile on your face. And remember who you are and who God is in you. How about that on one more Tuesday? <laughs>